Well, please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. Turn, if you will, into the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5. We'll read verse 8. And then also I'll read verse 13 to 16. Just to remind us that we are not simply abstracting a text, that there is a context and a purpose to these kingdom beatitudes. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, and then verse 13 to verse 16, page 810 in the Pew Bible. Let us hear the word of God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Let's pray. Almighty God, we desire to know you, your Son, to worship Father, Son, and Spirit. And so we pray, Lord God, that you would increase our understanding, increase our faith, increase our love, and grant us, Lord, to be those who seek that purity of heart. May then, Lord God, as your word says, may others see our good works. Perhaps, Lord, even those that do not know you, that they might be brought into your kingdom, giving glory to you. That is our great desire, that you will receive the glory. So prepare our hearts even now, that we might receive, Lord God, good from you. For you are a God of goodness, and we pray in the name of our Savior. Amen. Please be seated. Well, as we continue our way through the Sermon on the Mount, we're treating each of the Beatitudes individually. Uh, as we move through the Sermon, we'll deal with larger portions of text. And, and if you just flick through the Sermon itself, you can see that our Lord is attempting... Uh, and it's our duty to receive this, our Lord is delineating the differences between life in the kingdom and life in the world. But not just between life in the kingdom and life in the world, life in the kingdom and those who have some form of religiousness, those who taught in Israel a general religiosity, he speaks about the scribes and Pharisees, the Jewish leaders. Our Lord then is making a distinction between true, sincere Christians in the kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ and those who are in the world and those who are in some sense in the covenant people and yet not of the kingdom. You see, one element that distinguishes the sincere Christian from the world and from the religious formalist concerning which our Lord has much to say in this sermon, is a single-mindedness of devotion to God. A single-mindedness of devotion to God. That is to say, a purity of heart. You see, the world is devoted in a single-minded fashion uh, to, to the pursuit of self-interest. The religious formalist is devoted single-mindedly to the pursuit of religious reputation. But the Christian is called to be single-minded in his devotion to God Almighty and his love for Christ. That's the purity of heart of which this passage speaks. A single-mindedness, not a double-mindedness, but a, a single-mindedness, a one-track mind devoted to serving Christ. That is, in fact, what our Lord, through His Spirit and by His Word, is presently working in the Christian. A transforming of our minds so that we have a single focus in life. Our hearts are pure, not just cleansed, but they are on a single track. We are devoted to one thing, 
that is the glory of our great God. And so tonight I want to ask two things of this passage, verse 8. Uh, first of all, what is kingdom purity? We're going to uh, define this concept of being pure in heart. And then secondly, look at the blessings of purity in heart. So what is kingdom purity? Well, I've already tipped my hat to what I believe Scripture says it is. It is fundamentally a single-mindedness. A single-mindedness in a pursuit of God's glory. But the connections in the passage before us illuminate this kind of mentality. Purity is something of a parallel to mourning over sin. Remember we dealt with that, that sorrow over sin, uh, sorrow over how we've offended God, sorrow not just of that great offense against God, but also against each other, sorrow over the terrible effects of sin in our own lives, and also of the effects of sin in other people's lives. If you know anything about sorrow over sin, you'll know how, how deeply it can cast you down. How ruinous it is of joy in the Christian life. How divisive it is. How it mars our view of the grace and love of God. It's a natural response then to flee from such. To flee from that sin that has caused so much experiential damage in our own lives. It's a call, in a sense, to pursue a life of purity. Not stained by sin. So that we might never again offend the Lord in the way we have and experience the sorrows of our own sin. Purity also follows receiving mercy. Those who are recipients of divine mercy have within them a great motivator to pursue this kind of pure Christian life. We are ones who have received the mercy of God. As Thomas Watson's quote this morning at the supper reminded us, Christ made himself a, a sacrifice of sin. Can we not offer ourselves up as thank offerings of obedience to God Almighty? So we understand that the Beatitudes themselves are interlinked. There is an inseparable connection between each one of them. What then is our Lord speaking of when he speaks of a purity of heart? Now, immediately our minds might go to the obvious and we'll think of perhaps sexual immorality. That's clearly part of this, but that's far, far too narrow a definition of what our Lord is speaking of here. Because the rest of the sermon will give us an idea of what he means. Our Lord's going to deal with anger. Uh, he's going to deal with lust, most certainly, and adultery, but he's going to deal with keeping your word. Remember that, keeping your word. In marriage, in oaths, he'll deal with retaliation, judging people, loving your enemies. He'll deal at length with the religious formalist. Don't pray like the Pharisees, don't fast like them, and so on. You see, our Lord is revealing to us that purity of mind is actually a much broader concept than we might initially have thought. Purity of heart and mind in Scripture, and I'll show this in a minute, speaks of a straightness of mind, a single-minded focus upon Almighty God's glory. It's not a mind that is twisted or that is tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but it is a mind that is set upon one course, it's a course of devotion to Almighty God. It's a holy devotion to our God. That's a sanctified mind and heart. And that mind and that heart is a cleansed heart. That's actually the language in the Greek of this verse. Blessed are the cleansed. Now, that word cleanse in Greek has a broader meaning than just cleanse, but that's the typical meaning of that word, a cleansed heart. And that gives us a clue, brethren, to understand that before we get to the behavioral elements of what purity of heart actually is, we need to understand that in this beatitude, as with all the others, there is more than just a little nod to the reality of salvation that is wrought in the heart of a Christian. You see, it's not simply a practical thing, how can I be more pure in mind or in heart? It's not just about sanctification in that sense, because we know that our practice is determined by the state of our heart. 
out of the fullness of the heart, says our Lord, our mouth speaks. We know our practice is determined by the state of our own heart. And here we have this idea of purity, of cleansing. And those are ideas which, first of all, before they come to us in terms of the reality of what we must do, come to us in terms of what God has done already for the Christian. That purification that is first necessary by God of the Christian in order for the Christian then to act in a pure fashion. And we see this as part of God's new covenant that he promised through the prophet Ezekiel in chapter 36 and verse 24. God says in this new covenant that he is making, this is what he will do. He will take you from the nations and gather you from all the countries and bring you into your own land. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleannesses and from all your idols. I will cleanse you. We have then salvation being spoken of from beginning actually until end. And part of that is a purifying, a cleansing. I will sprinkle clean water on you, says the Lord. It's a picture of everything that is in salvation from regeneration all the way through to glorification. And in the middle of that is that the Christian is cleansed, cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And having been cleansed, as our Lord says uh, through Ezekiel, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uh, uncleannesses. There's a practical application to that. He then says in Ezekiel 36, 25, and from all your idols, I will cleanse you. From all your idols, I will cleanse you. There is a legal reality to this cleansing, that we are clean in Christ, and yet there is a transformative element to this cleansing, that we are consistently being changed. The removal of idols happens, in a sense, once for all, but it also happens, as we know, on a continual basis in our lives. And this is not just a physical thing. In fact, it's not preeminently a physical thing. It's a spiritual reality. And with that spiritual reality of cleansing by Almighty God comes what? A transformation of our minds so that we are no longer slaves to the idols that we once had. It's very important, brethren, we understand that in the context of the Sermon of the Mount... We have, with the coming of Christ, the dawning of a new era. What era is it? It's the new covenant era. That very covenant of which the Lord was prophesying through Ezekiel in chapter 6 through Jeremiah in his chapter 31, the dawning of the new era has come with Christ. That's why he comes proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom, the very outworking of the principles that were prophesied through Ezekiel is now happening in real time, as it were, in the ministry and in the person of Christ. And we see the practical application brought out for us in Scripture. That's why Paul will speak in Romans 12 and verse 2, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. How? By the renewing of your mind, by the Word and by the Spirit. There is a transformation Uh, There's a great change in us at regeneration. A new heart is given. But we know on top of that, God continues to work in an ongoing sense, day by day, week, month, year after year, we are being changed, sanctified, transformed. That's why we see the practical side, in a sense, of this idea of purity. We see that there is a, a legal, a forensic, a spiritual reality that happens in salvation, and yet there is an ongoing element to this purification, this cleansing. I've described it as a single minded devotion. In a sense, that's the practical element of this purification. We are purified by the work of the Spirit, by the granting of faith so that we're united to Christ. And then there is an ongoing purification, an ongoing transformation. It's the work of sanctification. Why do I focus upon this idea of single-mindedness? 
Well, I think Scripture points us to that idea itself. Turn back to Psalm 24 or just listen to these words. A question is posed in verse 3 of Psalm 24. The question is, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Remember, the blessing of the pure in heart is they shall see God. Okay? So, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who will stand in his holy place? Who by faith will see God in his house? Who is that kind of person? What do they need? What are their characteristics like? The answer is this. He who has, listen, clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands and a pure heart. Now, we understand immediately. First of all, that's a divine action that God has done in our lives. He has made us clean by faith uniting us to Christ. But it doesn't stop there because there is an ethical import to these words. The way we behave. Are we behaving consistently with our profession of faith? We say we are Christ. We say we are clean and our hands are pure. Sorry, our our hands are clean. Our heart is pure. Do we then live like that? Because Psalm 24 goes on to exegete that idea of clean hands and a pure heart, when it says in verse 4, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift his soul up to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Very clearly, the psalmist is linking to linking, uh, to the idea of clean hands and purity of heart the issue of honesty, of seeking truth and Only truth, uprightness of mind and uprightness of speech, for the psalmist here at least, is an identifier of those who actually have clean hands and a pure heart. That's the one who will enter into God's presence. That's the one who will ascend the hill and stand in the holy place. That's face to face with God. That's the one who will see God. The one whose mind is devoted to truthfulness. Who does not go down the paths of falsehood. He's on a single track, a single minded path. That's the practicality of purity of heart. It is, you see from us, the removal of that which is compromising and accommodating to the world. It's the removal from us, and so we are saying this is what we are to be, we are to remove that which accommodates and compromises with the world. As I mentioned earlier, that's seen by what God says in Ezekiel 36, I'll take your idols from you. I'll take that which you've set your heart on, because there's the track that leads to God, and there's the track of idolatry. God says, I'm taking your idols from you. I'm putting you back on track. Or I'm putting you on track, perhaps, for the first time. The Apostle James echoes this kind of language. He speaks in James 1, verse 8, of those who are double-minded, not single-minded, double-minded, unstable in all their ways. An even more striking language in the epistle of James, chapter 4, verse 8. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. In other words, don't be double-minded. Be single-minded. Cleansing leads to a single-mindedness, a devotion to that which is right, true, and good, which is summarized in Christ. The Christian is to be one who is undivided in his thought, his speech, his actions, and his mission. In that sense, he is to be an unashamed follower of Christ. So much so that James says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. The more single-minded you are, not double-minded to use James's language, the more single-minded you are in your devotion is you drawing near to God. What do we find? God draws near to us. Clearly, James here is echoing the language of the Old Testament. Repeated by Christ calling the Christian to a single-mindedness of thought, of deed, of theology, of practice. 
It is, if you like, a Christ focus. Not at the expense of Father and Spirit, because the Spirit is the Spirit of Christ, and no one comes to the Father except through Christ. But it is, brethren, to be decided and determined that we will follow the way. The way who is Christ. Again, we will not be tossed to and fro. That's not the kind of people we're going to be. We're not going to be easily distracted. As our Lord would say, don't turn to the left or to the right. Stay on track. Stay on track. Stay on path. That single-mindedness and purity of heart is clearly not simply merely outward. We understand that, don't we? That was the problem of the religious formalists of Christ's day. It says, blessed are those who are pure in heart. We know the heart is an idle factory. Or to use Calvin's language in the French, he says, the heart is a perpetual boutique for forging idols. And we know that it's out of the heart that comes trouble. Matthew 15, 19, for out of the heart come evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Those are prime examples of a divided mind, a mind that is setting its course on various things in life. It has no clear way. It is not following Christ who is the way. It has various ways. And to use the language back of Proverbs, there is a way, or there are ways which seem right to man, but their way is the way of death. But the way, that single-minded following of God, is through Christ. It is the way of life. The Christian is to have a one-track mind. A one-track mind. That's essentially the testimony of Scripture when it comes to this idea of purity of heart. Now, you can apply that to any number of, of challenges or besetting sins in your life. Uh, it could be sexual purity. Most certainly that is in view. It could be your view of, of finances or family or any other thing. Anything can become an idol to us. Are we setting our eyes on the true and living God or have we set our eyes off to the side, to the left or to the right, upon an idol? Is that where our life is heading? That is not purity of heart. How can it be that we who are Christians, who are regenerate, how can it be that we have so much trouble with our own sin? I'm assuming you can agree with that statement. Maybe I'm wrong in assuming that, but you ought to be able to say, how is it that I have so much trouble with my own sin? Well, I think there's three reasons, well, maybe more than three, but certainly three that we can put our mind to. Is it not the case that very often we tend to work with the idea that sin is almost inevitable in our lives? We're only human after all, and it's kind of inevitable that we're going to sin. That view is actually incorrect. It leads us to a low view of sin and consequently a low view of the kind of purity in heart, single-mindedness, that Christ is speaking of here. If we don't have a view that sin is wholly anti-God and anti-good, then we will never come to terms with fighting it in our own lives. The second thing I've already alluded to, we are naturally idolaters. And we have allowed that which is both legitimate and illegitimate to crowd out and cloud our view of God. Let me ask you a question. Children, look at this now. Is my hand bigger than this room? We know the answer. Is my hand bigger than all of you put together? We know the answer. But as I move my hand closer to my eyes, I can no longer see you. That's what happens when we hold things too close to ourselves, we hold them too precious in our lives, it obscures our view of God. It's idolatry. 
We have made something more important, even that which might be good, inherently good, a gift of God. We have made it of more importance than we have honoring God. The third thing is this, and this is pretty sobering. Sometimes we just enjoy our sin too much. That's the third reason why perhaps we struggle with sin. We just enjoy it too much. It might for a time leave a bitter taste in our mouths, uh, but not always. And in fact, we ought to confront the reality, brethren, that so well practiced are we at our sins that sometimes we're not even aware we are in sin. Sometimes we're not even able to identify what we're doing as sin. Other people can. They can look at us and see, well, that, that's a problem. Something's not right there. We are happy justifying ourselves. All those things are examples of double-mindedness. Double-mindedness. They're antithetical to the purity of heart of which our Lord is speaking. Is sin inevitable? By no means. Scripture says, Christian, that you are a new creation and you are to put sin to death. Being pure in heart is not letting anything obscure our vision of God. Not getting so close to anything or letting it get so close to us that it obscures our vision of God's goodness and His gifts. And we ought, brethren, and I suspect most of us are. Sometimes it's hard to see this. But I suspect most of us are. We ought to be so growing in this purity of heart that we no longer find sin quite as attractive as we once did. You might be thinking, well, I'm really struggling with a sin right now. I would say if you've been converted any length of time, look back 10 years ago. See how you were struggling with that same sin then, or 20 years ago, or however long you've been in the faith. It's very difficult sometimes to mark our own progress in the faith but those who delight in a pure heart will increasingly find sin less and less attractive, so we pursue it less and less. Actually, that's what's being done in you, dear Christian. That's what's happening. Even now through the Word, as you go home tonight, providing you're receiving the Word with humility and, and, and by faith, you can expect God to work in you. So that incrementally, not necessarily by leap and bound, but incrementally we grow more and more what conformed to the image of Christ. Not of the world, not of the religious formalist. This is the reality of kingdom life. Be encouraged. Be strengthened. Christ is working. The rest of the kingdom is not advancing and any individual Christian being left behind, it doesn't work that way. To be sure, we have to tend to our duties. We'll come to that in a moment. But if you're part of the kingdom by faith, you're being carried along by Christ, the great victor and the head of this kingdom. So we ought to ask ourselves, we ought to ask ourselves, are we holding things too close to our heart or to our eyes? Have we lost sight of God? What is dividing our attention? What has captured our heart? It is right to ask that question. And it's also right to look at what Christ has done for you already. It's also right to see what Christ is presently doing in you, shaping you, changing you, transforming you, perhaps by hardship, perhaps by the word. It is right to see what our Lord is doing for us. It's not right then to rest on our laurels and say, well, King Jesus will work it all out for me. We know he works through means. What is Jesus Christ to you? Do you love him? Or is he an intellectual fancy or a debating point? If he's the latter, then you've got problems. If he's the former, he's working in you. Are we grateful enough 
for what our Lord has done personally for us, that we will set aside those things which have perhaps for so long ensnared us, that we will be single-minded, not double-minded, that we won't give ourselves to those things that we know we, we can give ourselves to very easily. You know it. I know it. We can be so easily diverted so that even when we're doing basic things, ordinary things, they can be done in such a manner that we've lost sight where to do them for the glory of God and where to do them with all our strength. Even mundane matters around the house, small things, whatever our callings might be, why do we do what we do? Is it in response to the goodness of God that we have in Christ? Our Lord's going to summarize this kind of idea in Matthew 6 and verse 33. He'll say to us, seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. That's putting it positively. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Hebrews 12, 14 puts it negatively. Without holiness, no one will see the Lord. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Holiness, piety, seeking first the kingdom of God and its righteousness, call it what you will. Discipleship, that's what we're called to be. Disciples. Followers, we walk the path of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are there blessings to this path? We certainly know they are. There are. For they, right, says our Lord, for they shall see God. I say this cautiously, but purity of heart, in a sense, is its own reward. And I say that cautiously because we know that all reward is from God. But there is a great correlation between the, the process and the thinking, the acts of, of pure hearts, and the growth in grace of a pure heart. The reward is we see God. What do we see? We see more of His grace, more of His mercy, more of His love, His sovereignty, His justice, His righteousness. You see, the pure heart that is undivided in its devotion to God ought to expect to see more of that God. The pure heart that is undivided in devotion ought to expect to see more of that God. Because we're devoted not in some kind of mystical sense. We're devoted to what God has laid before us. We're devoted to His Word. We're devoted to His worship. We're devoted to fellowship we're devoted to the sacraments. We're devoted to prayer, all of which God has said He will bless us through. As we commune with God in the Word and in prayer and in those means, we ought to expect to see God. And see Him by faith, of course, we understand that, do we not? But the greater we pursue this purity, this single-mindedness, uh, in our hearts, we ought to expect that we will grow in grace and in knowledge of Christ. Our desires will be conformed, uh, not to the world, but to Christ. Our desires will be the glory of God, which was preeminently the desire of Christ. Even in the quietness of your own minds, which, if we're honest, are far more troubled than ever we let come out of our mouths, the quietness of our own minds. Can we silence those siren voices that seek to divert us, that so often ensnare us? We can. We have the Spirit of Almighty God dwelling in us. Pursuit of godliness, there's great gain the great gain is we will see God. God has promised to reward, reward those who are pure in heart. And I use that reward in a somewhat loose sense. But he's promised to reward those who are pure in heart 
with himself. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God, which is very different to what he says about the religious formalists in chapter 6. Chapter 6, verse 5, when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they might be seen by others. Religious covenant people, hypocrites, formalists, outwardly conforming to the law of God, but inwardly their hearts are graves. What does our Lord say the reward is for such? Truly, truly, I, I say to you, they have received their reward. What's their reward? The pat on the back from man. But they never see God. They never enjoy God. They never commune with God. Even when they're doing the things that God has ordained whereby we shall enjoy Him and commune with Him like prayer. They never get to see God. What a contrast. What a contrast. God rewards the godly with himself. Not on a quid pro quo sense. It's not you do this, God does that. It, it, it's not like that. We know that. Your godliness, your purity of heart is never godly enough or pure enough to merit, in a strict sense, God's blessing. But in his grace, look at what he's promised. In his grace, look at what he's promised. So even the smallest efforts, even the most meager, sin-tainted efforts at godliness and purity of heart, because God is gracious, he rewards. The merit has already been done. And Christian, you don't ever need to merit anything with God. Christ has done that for us. But that's not to say we do not need to exert effort. We do not need to strive. That's the language of Scripture. Working out our calling with fear and trembling. We're reminded, are we not, of what the Apostle John says in 1 John 3, tying these ideas together very closely. Beloved, we are God's children now. That's what we are now. God's children. We have seen, as it were, by faith, the, by faith, the face of God. And God shines the light of his face upon us daily and weekly. We are God's children now. Thanks be to God for that. But, says John, but what we will be has not yet appeared. We're going to change. We see the face of God now by virtue of his great work in us. We're adopted into his family. We may call upon him as father. By faith we apprehend him through Christ. Precious blessed promises. But there's something more to come. Something better, yes, better to come. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. Oh, isn't that a good promise? As we struggle with our sins now, we know we're slowly, slowly, piecemeal being conformed to the image of Christ. But when he comes again or when we die and we're raised from the dead, we shall be like him. Because, says John, we shall see him as he is. We shall be like him because we shall see him no longer with the eyes of faith, but with your own resurrected eyes. You will see the sun. We will see the sun together and we will worship him. What does John say is the practical application of this glorious truth that we see him now by faith? We will see him then by sight. What do we do as a result? 
and everyone who thus hopes in him, listen, purifies himself as he is pure. Our Lord Jesus says to us tonight, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Let's pray. We bless you, Lord, for truth and grace. We bless you for Christ, who himself was pure in heart, singly devoted to doing your will, to doing all that might achieve your glory, setting his face towards the cross, devoted to the command and mission you gave him. May we do likewise. May we do so, Lord, not ever attempting And give us the humility to recognize when we fail in this. May we do so never attempting to merit our way into your good books. But because we are your children now. And because we know we will see our Savior face to face. May we now purify ourselves in holiness. Give us grace. Soften our hearts, Lord God. That your word might penetrate deep within us. For we pray in Christ's name. Amen.